Welcome to Scholars 2000. I'd like to uh, welcome you on behalf of the South Texas Geriatric Education Center, better known as the STGEC, the lead component of the South, West, and Panhandle Consortium of Geriatric Education Centers. Dr. Michelle Saunders, the director of the GEC, is unable to be here today, but sends her greetings. I'm Dr. Carolyn Marshall, associate director of the GEC. This is the 15th year of the Scholars Program and the first year for distance learning transmission. The Geriatric Research, Education, and Clinical Center, the GREC, is our partner in presenting the Scholars Program. Dr. Michael Katz is the director of the GREC and Dr. Saunders is the associate director for education and evaluation. The Scholars Program that we're presenting now is a unique three-year grant funded by the U.S. Public Health Service Bureau of Health Professions intended to provide education and training in geriatrics and gerontology to health professionals. As trainees at the end of this program, you will receive a certificate indicating the number of actual hours you have attended. If it is necessary for you to miss any of the sessions, you will be able to make them up over the next two years. The presentations are being videotaped and we will be available at your site for review by year two. If you have any questions, please contact us. Now, you'll have a packet, it seems like quite a large packet of registration information, but it's essential that you fill out everything that we've given you. We've only asked the questions that are required um, of us by the Bureau, and um, these go into our reports. No names are used, but the data is very important, especially in the area of minority health and uh, disadvantaged sites. I think that's just about the end of the, the housekeeping uh, that I have to report on. If you have any questions, um, I'd like you to uh, ask them at the end of the program of our coordinator, and I'd like to introduce her now. Lily, would you please come up? This is Lily Porter Terillion, who is the coordinator for the Scholars Program. She'll be with you um, every week that we have a program. She's always available to answer questions, and if she uh, doesn't have the answer, she'll certainly find it. Um, so at this point, I'd like to turn the program over to Lily, who will introduce today's speakers. Thank you. Hello. If you need to contact me, our number is 210-567-1372. I want to make that clear so that if you have any questions, please let us know. Again, that's 210-567-1372. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Roger McCarter, who will present the physiology of aging and make it so interesting you won't want to leave the room, I promise. Thank you very much, Lily, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to have the opportunity of talking to you about one of the most dynamic areas of biological research today, and that is on the biology of aging. And I guess the first and most important question we might ask uh, is why all of the current popular interest in aging as a process and uh, why we all get old. Um, we are constantly bombarded by newspaper articles on uh, living longer and what to do about it. We're constantly being given advice uh, on television on what to do about it, and we're constantly being uh, hammered by people who would like to sell us something, some magic potion, which will enable us to live longer and to live healthier. Um, there are also, as all of you know, many, many books in this area. Um, for instance, books on successful aging, um, books on living uh, longer and looking younger. One of my personal favorites uh, is uh, a bestseller last year, 
um, Strong Women Stay Young, written by a, a very eminent researcher, woman researcher in this area. And of course, this was answered by one of the male researchers in the area, whose book is entitled The Testosterone Solution. Uh, so I think a question we might all ask is how are we going to evaluate all of these claims um, and what scientific basis can we really use to assess them? Well, as it turns out, and if I could have the lights at this stage, please, and let's get on to the first slide. Um, we're not alone in this tremendous interest in aging. There has been great interest in this area for many, many years. And what I have here is a photograph of a painting which was painted in the year 1546, uh, and this is taken from a slide from the Berlin National Museum of Art, um, and it expresses a hope which is alive and well in our society today, and that is the discovery of the fountain of youth. Here we have some elderly ladies uh, entering a pool from the right-hand side um, and going bathing in the fountain of youth and coming out as nubile young maidens, entering a tent, and there, of course, they're going to join the, the men. The men, as usual, have gone through long before and have been waiting anxiously. Um, so the Fountain of Youth is an idea that I think is alive and well today, that we would hope to have some sort of magic bullet, some sort of potion which would enable us to live longer and be younger and be healthier. Um, of course, from the 1546, we go to Rembrandt in the 1600s, and aging was very much of interest then. Uh, Rembrandt painted a series of self-portraits. And I'd like you to look at the progression in the features, which hopefully will come through on your screens, 55 to 63. Um, visible signs of aging from, uh, in somebody who aged successfully. Because at this stage of history, the average life expectancy was something like 40 years. So he lived long and he lived very well. Um, but I think we might ask why the tremendous pressure today on trying to find out what we can do to live longer and healthier, and the answer lies in statistics. In every industrialized country in the world today, the most rapidly growing segment of the population is those individuals 65 years of age and older. This is the most rapidly growing section of the population, and of course, it is also that segment of the population which is most in need of long-term, very expensive health care. So governments from Japan to the United States to France, Italy, and all over the industrialized world are appreciating the fact that we have an economic time bomb here with an, a rapidly growing aged population. We need to keep them healthy as they get older. Now, this sort of hysteria is kind of encapsulated in a, a newspaper article that was taken from, of all places, the New York, the New Orleans Times-Picayune. And it tells us that the Chinese have been urged to die early to make room for workers. Well, this is a solution that wouldn't go over well in China or in the United States. But on the other hand, it does highlight the problem. There are more than 45,000 centenarians in the U.S. today, and indeed in China, there are more than one million people, a hundred years of age and older. So I think the first question we have to ask is, what do we know about aging? And this is the first point. The first and possibly most obvious point is that aging is related to genes. For instance, nobody has ever seen a 100-year-old mouse. The maximum lifespan of a mouse is about three and a half years, in contrast to the maximum human lifespan, and the slide's a little out of date, because as we all know, there was a lady in France who lived to be 122. So the maximum human lifespan is very much longer than the maximum lifespan of a mouse, and clearly genes do play a role. But the surprising fact is that research today has indicated that while genes definitely play a role, they account amongst people for only about 40% of our total longevity. So let's take a look at a couple more characteristics of aging. And this is a slide taken from Runner's World magazine to make it a little popular. And it represents the time in hours taken to win a marathon race as a function of the age of the runner who won the race. And what I'd like to point out is even for superb athletes, who are 75 years old and win the marathon race at age 75, their times are much longer 
than individuals in their 20s and 30s who clearly are at their phys physical and physiological peak. So even in the case of superb elite athletes, there is an aging process and inevitable deterioration of function so that they get slower and slower and slower even though they have been practicing all their lives to keep on running. Here's another one. The maximal heart rate or your ability and mine to get our heart beating faster and as you can tell in men and in women whether they were sedentary all their lives or whether they were elite athletes the maximum heart rate goes down as a function of age inevitably. So there are some things that clearly happen no matter what state of health we're in. Here's another one that we're all familiar with and it's a plot of lean body mass or muscle mass as a function of age. Muscle mass in men goes down with age, it goes down in women with age, but as it turns out our body weights don't change that much so in fact what is happening is that while our muscle mass is going down our fat mass of course is going up and I think this is a common experience for most of us we're getting fatter and we have less and less muscle which of course is a very bad thing because when we reach 70s and 80s we will not have enough muscle mass perhaps to, ra to get ourselves out of a chair or, uh, or walk to the corner grocery store to buy groceries so this is a major major problem Another characteristic of aging is that there is a decline in many, many physiological systems. Here we have, for instance, nerve conduction velocity, basal metabolic rate, um, breathing, vital capacity, kidney function, kidney function, again breathing function, cardiac index. All of these functions go down as a function of age. And this slide was published in 1956 and what has been realized is that although there is this tremendous deterioration in bodily functions with age, it is not true for all people. Dr. Schock, when he did these studies, included people whose health was not good in old age. Nowadays we recognize the fact that in fact there are many individuals for whom functional decline is modest or not at all. So there are many individuals who are aging very successfully. Well, given those characteristics of aging, let's try to summarize them. Characteristics of aging, certainly number one, is maybe the most important. We have an increased probability of dying, and I think we can all relate to that. If you're 70, the chance that you will die is much greater than your probability of dying in your 20s. There is a change in body composition. We get fatter and we lose muscle mass with age. There is physiological deterioration. Our bodily functions are not quite as good as they were in the 20s. And number four is the one which most of the governments are focusing on. Number four is the fact that when we get older, we have a greater probability of getting age-related diseases, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and the second one, that if you do get a disease when you're older, it's much worse. Getting um, pneumonia at the age of 70 is much more stressful to the system than getting pneumonia when you're in your 20s. So with these characteristics of aging, let's see what we can say about the aging process. Certainly, aging results from a progressive, that is, it, it gets worse with time, and a fundamental change. Something is happening in the cells of our bodies to make us get older. The manifestations of this fundamental change or fundamental aging process are functional decline, increased ability or incidence of disease, and reduced ability to respond to a challenge. So if we're challenged in any way, it's much worse if we're older than if we're younger. All of this leads to the following clumsy definition. And I want to stress that this is the best there is. This is the best definition that we have at this time, and it's not especially useful. Let me just go through it. If we wanted to define aging, the best definition we have is that the aging process it represents deteriorative changes with time during post-maturational life. And this is important because we recognize that it's not that we start aging from the day that we're born, but rather we only start aging after we reach maturity or uh, post-maturational life after puberty. And these changes underlie an increasing vulnerability to challenges. That is, any stress that comes along is going to hit us harder when we're older, 
and thereby decreasing the ability of the organism to survive. That means there's increased probability of us dying as we get older. Now, as I pointed out, this is a very lengthy definition, and this is the best one we have. But if we're to try to evaluate whether each one of us should be taking melatonin, whether we should be taking um, growth hormone or testosterone or any one of the other thousands of things which uh, commercial suppliers are trying to get us to take, we need to be able to measure it in some way which is different from this. Gerontologists have been looking for a way of measuring the rate of aging for a very long time. And the only gold standard which is currently available is related to population changes. And I want to spend some time on this slide explaining this so that you have a really good feel for how we measure aging changes. Let us imagine that there are 100 of us all taking the seminar this afternoon, that there are 100 of us and that we're all born at the same instant in time and that we're born on the Serengeti Plains in Africa 50,000 years ago. If we were all born at the same time, with the passage of time, in fact, 50% of us would have died by the age of 10. Why did we die? We didn't die from aging. We died because we were eaten by lions, we died of starvation, we died of dehydration, we died from disease, we died from a large number of causes so that the life expectancy in Africa 50,000 years ago was very, very short, about 10 years. Now, if we'd been more fortunate and been born in the caves in Europe 15,000 years ago, 50% of us would have survived to the age of about 22 or 23. If we'd been very lucky and been born in Rome, 1100 BC, we'd have running water, we'd have some semblance of a sewage system, 50% of us would survive to the age of about 35 or 36. Now, if we'd been very, very fortunate, 50% of us born in the United States in 1970, we would have a life expectancy or 50% survival in the 70s. Now, what has changed in all of this time? Surely not the rate of aging. People are living longer and longer and longer because we're better able to protect them from the environment. So what has changed over the course of human history is life expectancy. And that is the ability of 50% of people born at the same time, 50% of them, to survive to a given age. Life expectancy has increased. What has not changed, as far as we can tell, in all of this time, is the maximum lifespan, down here. The age of the oldest individuals. That is, even in Africa 50,000 years ago, there probably were some individuals who were very lucky, very robust, and born in the right place, who were able to survive to a very old age. Certainly in Rome, there were individuals who survived to 100 years of age. And there will be many individuals born in 1970 in the United States who will survive to 100 or more years of age. So our gold standard for measuring a change in the rate of aging is not whether life expectancy increases, because we know that that is due to many factors which have nothing to do with aging, but rather if melatonin prolongs life, if antioxidants prolong life, it must prolong the maximum length of life. So our gold standard for testing lotions and potions which prolong life is whether or not these potions will extend the maximum lifespan. And that's the standard that we want to look at. Well, with that as a background, and uh, perhaps I should pause here to inquire whether anybody has any questions at this stage. Uh, so, for instance, uh, people in McAllen, do you have any questions? Or um, Corpus Christi or Edinburgh, if you have any questions, I'd be very pleased to take them. I've kind of been barreling along here. If not, from our audience in San Antonio, are there any questions which you'd like to address? No? Okay. We're going along okay. I'll keep going in that case. The, the next item I would like to address is why do we get old? What do we know about the aging process? Because we're going to evaluate it using the curves I've just talked about. What do we know about the biology of aging? And I think as I've indicated to you, 
This is a very exciting time in scientific research in the biology of aging because there is not only tremendous governmental support of this activity, but there is a great deal of popular interest in the scientific research on aging. The current views, we used to believe that there might be one single aging process. That would be very optimistic. If there was a single aging process, then perhaps we could develop one pill that could get rid of this aging process and so we'd all live longer and be healthier. There's a great deal of evidence today that there probably is not one single aging process but rather many primary aging processes and that these primary aging processes cause us to age because they impact the function of many different bodily systems. So, for instance, it's not just that your cardiovascular system is getting old or your respiratory system is getting old. It's because all of these systems are suffering impaired function at different rates and the primary aging processes are working on all of these different systems. Now, let me get into some theories. Now, I thought I'd start off with one, uh, one of the theories as to why we get old. Um, and this is a very, very popular one, although its origin dates back all the way to 1928. This gentleman, Dr. Pearl, published a book based on his a lifetime of scientific research, and he said that all of the evidence he developed in this book suggests that the duration of life, or life expectancy, varies inversely as the rate of energy expenditure. In short, the length of life depends inversely on the rate of living. The idea here is that we've got a certain fixed number of heartbeats. In other words, if you use up your allotted number of heartbeats, that's it, you die. Um, it was a very popular view. In fact, it is a view which uh, carries on very well today. There are many people who still believe that the rate of energy expenditure, that is your metabolic rate, limits the length of life. Now, actually, in my laboratory, we've spent about 15 years I think rather convincingly disproving this theory because we've shown that many, many laboratory animals, in fact, having the same rate of energy expenditure can be induced to live very, very different lengths of life. So I think there is a great deal of experimental evidence against it. On the other hand, there is uh, experimental evidence in support of it, r largely based on this type of graph. I know it's very complicated, but the essential feature, I think, will come across to you. On this axis is the lifespan potential in years. In other words, the maximum lifespan. On this axis is the metabolic rate. And what I'd like you to see is that there are some animals that have a very low metabolic rate, like the African elephant, like the human, or the horse, a low metabolic rate, and they have a very long life. In contrast, animals which have a very high metabolic rate, like a mouse or a shrew, have a very short lifespan and a very high metabolic rate. So there is a great deal of evidence suggesting that if you have a high metabolic rate, you have a short lifespan. On the other hand, if you have a very low metabolic rate, you have a very long lifespan. Again, we have done a great deal of research investigating curves like this, and while it looks good, what these investigators have done is to not plot the thousands of animals that don't fit on these curves. So there are many, many animals that don't fit on these curves, so we tend to put this down. However, I must tell you that this is still a very, very popular idea today. Now, the most popular theory, and I'm sure all of you are aware of this, is related to oxidative free radical damage. All of us are bombarded with the need to take antioxidants. Now, what's the basis of that? It's also tied into metabolic rate. As, as we all know, we need oxygen in order to survive. Oxygen is burned in the cells with our bodies with metabolic fuels like glucose or sugars and uh, fatty acids in the process of oxidative respiration and convert it to water. And that respiration produces energy, but it also produces a group of oxidative free radicals which are very damaging to the cells of our bodies and these are usually removed by the enzyme superoxide dismutase which converts the oxidative free radicals to hydrogen peroxide. But hydrogen peroxide as it turns out is very damaging too and hydrogen peroxide can be converted to water by the enzymes catalase or glutathione peroxidase. 
Now this theory was first put forward in 1956 and it is certainly alive and well today. The fact that oxidative free radicals somehow produce damage in the cells of our bodies and that this damage is not repaired. For instance, there's some evidence that the enzyme activity of superoxide dismutase and catalase and, or glutathione peroxidase, that these enzyme activities go down as a function of age. So that there's less protection against the creation of these free radicals. Another and related theory is the glycation theory of aging. And the glycation theory of aging is very much the same idea. Instead of oxidative free radicals, the idea here is that the metabolic fuels, not oxygen, but now sugars, are damaging. The basis for this is something that is probably of com common observation to many of you, uh, and it started with Dr. Cerami at Rockefeller University in 1985, making the observation that um, diabetic patients exhibited many of the signs of premature aging. So diabetics exhibit premature aging, they're ex aging faster and we all know they have elevated blood sugar or poorly controlled blood sugar. So the idea is that our need for plasma glucose inevitably means that some of the glucose doesn't get burned by the cells of our body but rather reacts with proteins and these reactions with proteins and with DNA lead to the creation eventually of substances called advanced glycosylation end products which the body in fact cannot metabolize. One example of, a, of an AGE is pentosidine which we measure in the lab. Advanced glycosylation end products would mean that the proteins cannot carry out their normal functions. The DNA could not carry out its normal function because it's been irreversibly modified by glucose. This glycation theory of aging was recently brought together with the uh, oxidative theory of aging in one shape and there's a great deal of excitement now in the research community because these two seem to be coming together. That is that the existence of plasma glucose, we have to have sugar in our blood in order to live, but the existence of this sugar in the blood leads inevitably to some glycation of proteins and DNA and also leads to the creation of oxidative free radicals. It's now been shown that the presence of glycated molecules stimulates oxidative stress or oxidative free radicals and vice versa. Oxidative free radicals stimulate the formation of glycated uh, macromolecules. Both of these things, oxidative damage and glycation, lead to tissue pathology and decreased function and hence to aging. So we are currently searching for mechanisms in which to test this theory and also mechanisms to reduce glycation and oxidative stress. Now I guess at this stage, these are just a couple of the theories of aging which are currently of interest. Um, at this stage, we have disproved most of the theories of aging. These two are still very viable and I think um, we might move at this stage to say, what can we do about aging? As most of us know, we live in a society which has gone crazy on exercise. I think there is a universal perception that exercise is good for you. I must tell you that that was not the general feeling 50 years ago. 50 years ago, when people believed in the rate of living theory of aging, the, the um, ability to exercise was regarded as probably a negative because if you burned up your calories more quickly, you'd surely shorten your lifespan. I think today there is tremendous evidence that this type of aerobic activity is of great benefit to the cardiovascular system. Not so much your muscles, but the cardiovascular system. And s since most of us are going to die of cardiovascular disease, aerobic type exercise is very essential. The question is, does aerobic type exercise slow down the rate of aging? Now, it's very well appreciated today, too, that you can't just do aerobic exercise because many of us will have great cardiovascular systems, but when we get into our 80s, we will not be able to get out of a chair because we've lost all our muscles. So in order to maintain muscle mass, you actually have to do strength training. Um, I hate to say it, but Arnold Schwarzenegger was right. 
you really need to do strength training in addition to cardiovascular training. So I think there is overwhelming evidence today that a combination of aerobic exercise with strength training is essential for the maintenance of health. Let me just give you one study which was completed by my colleague Bill Evans at the University of Arkansas some time ago. Um, uh, Bill Evans and his colleagues uh, got hold of a number of elderly people in a nursing home in Boston. The oldest individual was 96 years old, a, a gentleman, 96 years old. They put them on a strength training routine and these were individuals who could not do anything for themselves. They had to be helped out of chairs, they couldn't walk for themselves, etc. After six weeks on a strength training program, these individuals, including the 96-year-old man, were walking around perfectly well by themselves. So strength training works. The evidence at this stage is overwhelming. We do need to do it, but I think we can also ask a question, will this slow down the rate of aging, or is it simply restoring a function that we always had? What are the effects of exercise? Here's an effect of exercise on breathing. FEV 1.0 stands for the forced expiratory volume in one second. So on this axis, we're looking at your ability to breathe out forcefully in one second. How much air can you breathe out as a function of the age of the individual? And what I'd like you to see that most of us lose the ability to breathe out forcefully along this curve. Former athletes, that is those who were very strong athletes but gave up, are higher. They lose the function at the same rate and currently active athletes are up here, they still lose the function at the same rate, but at any given age, they have a better ability to breathe out forcefully in one second. This is a rather complicated one, but it's, uh, I would like you to carry home the message that um, 20,000 Harvard alumni who were followed for 20 years, actually for 16 years, from 1962 to 1978, for those who were exercising quite vigorously, more than 2,000 kilocalories every week of physical activity, at any given age, let's just look at the age 60 to 64, 73% of the individuals carrying out moderate ac exercise were alive, whereas only 63% of the individuals who were much more sedentary were still alive. So there's no question that there is increased survival as a function of putting more activity into f physical exercise. The question still is, is it slowing down the rate of aging? Well, we address that question by putting animals into running wheels and letting them run all their lives, and the results were very, very clear cut. Here is a survival of animals who were sedentary, that is just moving around their cages all their lives, versus animals who are running about four kilometers a day over most of their lives. As you can see, 50% of the animals lived longer if they were exercising, in perfect agreement with the human studies. On the other hand, the maximum lifespan was identical for both groups of animals. So what we would say is that exercise, like better sanitation, like better health care, like a lot of things, exercise improves life expectancy. It does not slow down the rate of aging, however. The rate of aging proceeds. It simply improves your ability to withstand a stress at any given age. Maximum lifespan is unaffected. So exercise is good, but it will not slow down the rate of aging. Is there anything that will? Well, believe it or not, the secret in this area has been known for about 50 years. And it's being explored very, very vigorously today, but it's not one that most people will want to adopt. The only manipulation which has ever been shown to slow the rate of aging is to eat less. Um, we in San Antonio have a team that's been working on this for the past 20 years, and I can tell you that not one of the other investigators in this area has eaten less, even though the research data are overwhelmingly convincing. For most of us, eating ad libitum means that we add fat and we grow a little bit, but most of the energy goes out as heat and work. The secret to aging seems to be in how the food is processed when we ingest it. And if you eat less, it's processed differently. For instance, here is a group of rats fed ad libitum, and they die in the following way. 
It's a very nutritious meal. They don't exercise much and they just sit in their cages and they die according to this curve. We take genetically identical rats and feed them 40% less food. They live much longer. They have a longer life expectancy. But the very important point is that the maximum lifespan has been increased. So the fact that the maximum lifespan has been increased leads us to believe that dietary restriction or restriction of food intake is a critical uh, factor in slowing down the rate of aging. Now, of course you might think, is it the fat in the diet? Is it the vitamins in the diet? Is it the minerals in the diet? And we have spent 20 years investigating that. It is one thing only. It is the number of calories in the diet. We have varied the fat content. We have varied the vitamins. We have varied the minerals. And in every case, you have to restrict calories in order to extend the life of the animals. This is a very powerful phenomenon. For instance, here is a group of many different colonies of rats all fed the restricted diets for different periods of their life. Here is a, rat, a group of rats that eat like I do, ad libitum, and they die according to this curve. The next group of rats were fed the restricted diet only while they were young, and they still lived lo uh, longer. The next group of rats were started in adulthood from, let's say, human age 25 onwards, and they lived uh, much longer than the ones eating ad libitum. And here is the group of rats that were fed the restricted diet over most of their lifespan. So this is a very potent phenomenon. Now, if it were just living longer, I think people would be less interested in this, although it is certainly a striking event. It would be a catastrophe for us and for our children if we all lived a great deal longer. So the importance of this is not so much that food restriction increases life expectancy and maximum lifespan. The really important part of this manipulation is that age changes are delayed so that all of the rats, and this has been tried now in many, many other animals, all of the animals that it's been tried in, when they get old, they still retain a lot of health. One of the reasons they retain a lot of health is because this, and this is the most important part, retards the progression or prevents the occurrence of age-associated diseases. There is a striking effect of this dietary restriction on cancer in particular. The National Cancer Institute has picked up on this and is now funding a massive program to investigate why dietary restriction reduces the incidence of cancers because it's a very striking effect. It is so striking that in many of the animals who are fed the restricted diet, <coughs> that is these people, when they do start dying, we have very expert rodent pathologists and they cannot tell what the cause of death actually was because there is no obvious pathology. So there is a striking reduction in age-associated diseases, cardiovascular disease, renal disease, and in particular cancer. So there's tremendous interest in this phenomenon. Well, how does it work? Our research team at the UT Health Science Center here in San Antonio is involved in a worldwide race because we feel that this is one of the most dramatic events of practical application for people. We understand that human beings will never cut down on the amount of food they eat. We all enjoy eating too much. So what we would like to do is to find out how this works. If we can find out how this phenomenon works, then perhaps we can get the same effect without eating less. My particular laboratory is investigating one of the most striking findings of dietary restriction. Food restricted animals have a lower blood sugar over the course of a day and as they get older and older the lower blood sugar is retained. So animals fed ad libitum have a higher blood sugar throughout their lifespan and we feel according to the scheme I gave you earlier on that the lower blood sugar may be associated with less free radical damage, less glycation damage, and that this lower blood sugar may be a key factor in the mechanism. And if that proves to be the case, it may be that we could design foods which will produce lower blood sugars while at the same time inducing health. Our conclusion 
at least from many of our studies, is that dietary restriction has altered the characteristics of glucose or sugar metabolism so that animals are able to maintain high rates of utilization even while the plasma glucose is low and blood insulin levels are very low. And the two of these being low decreases the long-term harmful effects inherent in the use of these metabolic fuels. So convinced are scientists in different parts of the country that these results may be true that many of the professional scientists involved in these research activities have now started restricting their own food intake. Um, I don't believe this is wise at this stage because we all have individual differences in our needs for metabolic fuels. Um, there is no question that from mice to monkeys to men, the effects that we've seen are very, very consistent. You may remember um, an experiment which was carried out in the desert of Arizona not very long ago called the Biosphere 2. Individuals were placed into an environment in which they lived for several years. They grew their own food and they were going to manufacture their own oxygen and had uh, devices to remove carbon dioxide. Well, as it turned out, they couldn't grow as much food as they thought they were going to grow. So quite by accident, because they couldn't take anything into the biosphere, these people were restricted in their food intake by about 40% of what they normally ate, exactly as in our lab experiments. One of the uh, scientists involved in that project was also involved in food restriction studies and measured blood sugar and all these other things and found results in people exactly the same as what we have seen in laboratory rodents, in monkeys, in chimpanzees, and in every other creature that's ever been studied. So we believe that dietary restriction is a very powerful manipulation and to date the only one which has been shown to slow down aging processes. Finally, let me wind up with what do we know today that would produce successful aging? Successful aging obviously means different things to different people, but I think you can tell here we have an elderly couple. Very significantly, they're skating. Even at their age, they're not worried about falling and breaking a bone. They're confident in their attitude. They're clearly enjoying life. They are aging successfully. What do we know about the components? Number one, you have to have a healthy cardiovascular system, so you have to do aerobic exercise. You have to exercise. Number two, you have to maintain your bone mineral density, bone mass. There's a great deal of evidence now suggesting that muscle function is tied into maintenance of bone mass. So keeping yourself strength trained, keeping your muscles functional, and adding to your muscle mass will keep your bones healthy as well. Strength training is essential for the maintenance of muscle mass. So we need to exercise. Nutrition, most people believe, is the single most important factor. We need to be much more careful of what sort of foods we put into our bodies. And the evidence at this stage is quite overwhelming that we should be eating less than we are right now. And finally, uh, my colleague, um, uh, Melissa Telemantes, is going to be talking to you in the next session about the sociological and um, social aspects of aging. There is no question that physiological health is tied into mental health. So maintaining an active involvement in your community, maintaining an active involvement in society, and being involved in a caring relationship with other people is essential for the maintenance of physiological health as well. I thank you for your time, and I would be very pleased to entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. I guess, uh, Lily, that we would call it quits at that stage in the absence of any questions. Sure. Regarding the dietary restriction, yes. is there any specific diet like less fat or less sugar? Or no. Or no, I think this is one of the remarkable things that we have found because while it is very clear that the average North American diet of 40% fat is clearly destructive to health, there's no question about that. But once you get the fat beyond, let's say, 25% or below around 25% or less, there is no evidence 
that eating less and less fat is going to promote uh, health from this way. In fact, uh, there is rather other evidence that if you have too little fat in your diet, it could be de uh, deleterious to your health. There are essential nutrients, some essential fatty acids that we have to have in the diet. So it is clearly not fat, although you can destroy your body by eating too much fat. That is clear too. But um, we have varied the calories, uh, we have varied the fat, we varied the protein. The type of protein can be very important for disease. Uh, for instance, we found that uh, casein, which is a protein in milk, uh, fed to our rats, produced kidney disease in large numbers. If we simply shifted the protein source from casein to soy protein, the kidney disease disappeared completely. We don't know why. But the same number of calories was coming in for that protein source, the same amount of protein, but simply because it was soy protein and not casein, meant that the rats no longer died of kidney disease. So I believe that the source of protein is very, very important. I, I have difficulty uh, understanding the concept of aging and lifespan. Yes. Yes, I think it's a very difficult one. It's a question of what we mean by aging. Uh, lifespan usually relates to the maximum length of life of the longest lived person in that community. Life expectancy is the average lifespan. So that, for instance, if all of us in this room were born at the same time, some of us would die when we're 40, some would die when we're 50, some would die when we're 80, and one or two of us would make it to 100. The maximum lifespan is usually what we mean by lifespan, but life expectancy is what most people talk about. For instance, when um, there, there are many claims all the time, as you know, people say now you should have growth hormone. People say you should be taking DHEA. The studies that support those claims support in some way an extension of life expectancy. Not a single one of these things has ever been shown to extend maximum lifespan. And that is the gold standard for saying that you have slowed down the rate of aging. Extending life, a maximum lifespan and also cutting down on disease and improving the health and vigor, the physical vitality at any age. And there is one thing that does that, and only one thing, as far as we know from all over the world, and that is cutting back on calories. It's such a simple thing. There's no money in it, so nobody has jumped on it. Um, but if we can find out how this thing works, so that you don't have to eat less, but you simply modify your diet in some way, uh, it could be of tremendous benefit to people in producing healthy older people. And that's the goal of this research. Okay, thank you.